Hello everybody, this is Chris back again with The Ancient Scholar. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, the type of mechanical ventilation. We'd finished the video on talking about the SST and calculating uh, tubing compliance and uh, volume loss of tubing compliance if we have to manually calculate. So next we're going to talk about uh, step two and that's choosing the type of ventilation. And as I alluded to before, generally as a general rule most adult patients will go on to what's known as volume control ventilation. There are two primary types of ventilation and what I mean by type of ventilation is I mean what I'm, what I mean, what I'm trying to, to convey is the type of ventilation is a, a cycling mechanism. And that's what tells the ventilator to cycle from inspiration to exhalation. There, there are generally considered to be three types. There's something called time cycle, and that's where you actually set a time. Uh, it hits a certain time, and inspiration stops, and I go into exhalation. We don't see time cycled ventilation um, as much uh, as we used to, you may still see it in some of the um, operating theaters, on some of the anesthesia machines, and um, some of the neonatal ventilators, like transport ventilators, I believe something called the MVP-10, which is fairly common on some of the isolettes, is a time-cycled, uh, pressure-limited ventilator, um, but it is ultimately time-cycled. Uh, so you, you do see time-cycled uh, but really, when we're talking about placing the initial um, placement of, of, an, of an adult, or initiating mechanical ventilation on a doll, generally it's going to come down to two types, volume control ventilation and pressure control ventilation. So let's talk about what volume control ventilation is. Volume control ventilation is I set a certain tidal volume into the ventilator. I tell the ventilator, ventilator, I want you to give the patient this much volume. Once the patient gets that volume, I want you to stop giving it, and then I want you to let the patient exhale. And so the ventilator cycles off of the delivered volume. For example, I choose a tidal volume of 500 milliliters. The ventilator then delivers 500 milliliters, and once 500 milliliters is delivered into the patient, it stops, and the patient is allowed to exhale. So the ventilator terminates inspiration at a set volume. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, some of the pitfalls of this type of ventilation. Um, certainly the, the pro is that there's a set volume. I know exactly how much volume is going into my patient. However, the ventilator doesn't care about pressure. And um, as, as we know through um, various studies, uh, specifically uh, studies uh, that have been highlighted on the ARDSnet um, website, which is a very worthy website to checking out, anybody involved in critical care, anybody involved in ventilator management, because ARDS, or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, is such a big deal. Well, what they find is um, if I exceed uh, certain pressures in the airway, I can have more problems with ARDS. And so the recommendations are now to try to keep what's known as the plateau pressure, and we'll talk about that a little later on, um, but you really have two types of inspiratory pressures that we monitor. The peak inspiratory pressure, and that's the highest pressure encountered, period. And then this thing called the plateau pressure, which is actually the, the actual pressure in the alveoli themselves. Um, and, of course, it's, it's what, what, you've used, what you used last semester to calculate something known as static compliance. And that is um, compliance when there is no movement or flow of air. And... Um, Generally, that that will be when I inhale. I hold it at peak in at the end of inhalation before I exhale, and then I measure the pressure. And that pressure is indicative of the pressure inside of the alveoli. Now, while I am inhaling, during the process of inhalation, um, whatever that highest pressure is, that's known as the peak inspiratory pressure. Now, the peak inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure are generally different. Uh, because as I'm inhaling, as gas is going through my airway, it can encounter different obstructions. There's maybe a small endotracheal tube in place. And, and so there are different things that can cause that pressure to be elevated. But the plateau pressure uh, at the end of inhalation is really measuring the pressure in the alveoli themselves. And that is indicative of uh, what's going on in the alveoli of what we call static lung compliance. And if we exceed pressures of about 30 to 35 in the plateau pressure, um, there does appear to be uh, a higher uh, higher risk of our patients developing um, 
a volume trauma, barrel trauma injuries, uh, and um, things like ARDS and so on and so forth. So we try to, to limit those pressures. Well, in volume control ventilation, it doesn't care about the pressure. The ventilator doesn't care about the pressure. It just delivers a volume. So in volume control ventilation, we have to monitor the pressures very closely, see what's going on. Now, there's a, another type of ventilation called pressure control ventilation. And instead of setting a tidal volume, I now set a peak inspiratory pressure. Before, in volume control uh, ventilation, we were monitoring the peak inspiratory pressure. In pressure control ventilation, we're actually setting. We are setting. We're telling the ventilator, the ventilator, you deliver gas until you get to a certain pressure, and then you stop. You don't deliver anymore. Now, this has uh, some advantages over volume control. Generally, pressure control is something we move to after volume control has failed. Uh, the good thing about pressure control is that we can limit pressure in the airway, pressure in the lungs, because the ventilator is told. We tell the ventilator, don't exceed this pressure. So that is a good thing in that um, we are not exceeding pressures. And as we as we'll talk about in different in subsequent videos, the way the flow of gas is delivered is generally different in pressure control ventilation. And we generally, when we look at our flow waveform, um, you'll generally see what's known as a descending ramp. Um, some people will say that's a um, a uh, decelerating ramp. I really uh, have big issues with the term deceleration. Um, just maybe because of some of my physics background. I do not prefer to use that terminology. It's out there. I prefer to use the term descending ramp. Basically what happens is it starts at delivering the peak flow, whatever that the highest flow setting is, and then it tapers off. The, the, the flow delivered um, decreases. And this is, seems to ventilate um, and it, it seems to get gas and do parts of the lungs that gas wouldn't normally go to. So there, there's another advantage of pressure control. Now, volume control delivers a constant peak flow throughout the entire phase of inspiration, and that'll be what's called a square waveform. And it's kind of like a scuba diver. Um, if my peak flow is at 50 liters per minute, for example, in volume control, I'll trigger the ventilator, or the ventilator trigger itself, and it'll go and it'll deliver 50 liters per minute throughout the entire inspiratory cycle and then cycle to exhalation. Um, so it's very different. It's not as physiological as what, what a normal person would breathe. Normally how we breathe, we breathe through what's called a sine wave, where um, it's a little easier to, to draw. Anyone in physics, of course, you're very familiar with graphing a sine function, and it, and it looks like a wave. But basically, uh, this is volume control, and this is the pressure time, uh, the, vol uh, the flow time waveform. Sorry about that. This is a flow uh, time wave uh, scalar. Uh, again, if my peak flow is at 50, I deliver that peak flow throughout inspiration. This is volume control. This is generally um, pressure control ventilation, where I start at my peak flow and then it tapers down. They call it descending ramp. How a normal person breathes is something called a sine waveform, and again, this is a flow time scalar that we're looking at, where I start at zero flow, I begin to inhale. I get as I inhale, as my lungs begin to inflate, and my alveoli begin to inflate. I reach some sort of maximum flow, and then as my lungs are beginning to um, become inflated, of course the the flow is going to slow down. Lungs are full, and then I exhale. So this is called a sine wave. And if, you go, if you're good at trigonometry, you'd be very familiar with a, a sine function, again, because it looks like a sine wave graphed out. So you can see that pressure control ventilation is, very sim is, 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 is much more similar to physiologic breathing. But pressure control ventilation does not care about the volume delivered. So if I have very stiff and non-compliant lungs, um, I may be underventilating or hypoventilating my patients. So what I need to monitor it very closely in pressure control ventilation is I need to monitor the volume delivered um, very closely in pressure control because I can either over or underventilate my patients because the ventilator doesn't care about volume. It only cares about pressure. So those are the basic introduction to the types of ventilation. Again, generally in a 